Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, thank you for checking out the channel. So I recap live trials so you have something to listen to while you're crafting. If you're not a crafter, you can listen as well. So today we're going to begin the recap coverage of the trial of the state of Nevada versus Robert Tellis. Now, Robert Tellis is the politician in Las Vegas that uh, ran for re-election as the public administrator and lost. And some things happened after that. He is now on trial for murder. What is this all about? Stay tuned. So Robert Tellis is on trial. Now, he had some attorneys. He's gone through a few attorneys. Then he was going to represent himself. He has now got a Cracker Jack attorney. Because I'm thinking this whole time, uh, today I'm going to recap the opening statements. And make sure you stick around. Because after I recap the state's opening statement, which is kind of predictable considering the... Um, you know, I did a preview of this case and most of what she covered in her opening statement was in this preview. So uh, it'll be kind of repetitive, but stick around because I'm thinking, what could he possibly say to defend himself? Well, you are not going to believe it. So stick around to the end so you can hear what his defense is. Um, yeah. So let me set the stage. This is in Las Vegas. And right away, um, I'm like, wait a minute. I recognize this process, these two prosecutors and I'm I, like all night I'm racking my brain. Where have I seen these two prosecutors before? So uh, they were the prosecutors on the Thomas Randolph case. I don't know if you remember Thomas Randolph. He had uh, six wives, five, six wives. Uh, I think I named it the Black Widow murder trial. I'm going to put the playlist up here if you want to take a look. It was a it was actually a retrial and uh he was on trial for murder of his wife Susan. It was, it was a very very interesting trial because he was trying to frame the handyman that he hired. Um and he killed the handyman as well. So he was on trial for the murder of his wife and the murder of the handyman. Yeah. And he tried to look like he tried to make it look like him having to murder the handyman was because the handyman was, you know, he caught him in the middle of this murder of his wife and he was going to be murdered. So he had to murder him. And it was the whole thing was a setup, the whole thing. So if you want to listen to that. So these are the same prosecutors. This is in front of Judge Michelle Levitt. I don't remember if this is the same judge. It could be. But in any case. She starts the case in front of the jury by giving the jury instructions. And I was uh, particularly interested to hear that the jury will be allowed to ask questions. Yeah. Um, but she made a point to say, I don't encourage it because, you know, the attorneys, they've got everything prepared and they've, they're they going to ask all the questions. I'd be like, nope. You know me, if I have to ever go on jury trial, I've got questions. Trust me. So this all stems out of the death of Jeff German. He was a reporter for the Review Journal in Las Vegas. And this happened on September 2nd of 2022. So Robert Tellis is charged with murder with the use of a deadly weapon on a person over 60 years of age. All of these are aggravating factors that he used a weapon uh, and this Robert Gehrman was a senior citizen. Jeff Gehrman had been writing articles about Robert Tellis. Robert Tellis was a public administrator and uh, he had been accused of being bullying and um, improper conduct in the office as well as some other things like this is this case is going to be such a tangled web. I could, the state gets up there during their openings and they make it sound very straightforward. You know, um, you we're going to hear from a couple uh, named the Baileys. Uh, they were worried about Mr. Gurman. So 
uh, on September 2nd, uh, they see his garage door open and they're texting him and he's not responding. So uh, his uh, the husband says, you know, if he hasn't responded by tonight, I'm going to go over there, close the door, you know, and he never responded. So he goes over, closes the garage door. And the, so the following morning, um, he goes over, he discovers the body and... Jeff Gurman is deceased in his side yard. So we're going to hear from the Baileys. We're going to hear from the medical examiner um, about the injuries to Robert Gurman. He had a uh, sharp force injury. So the, the weapon was a knife and he was in the beginning of stages of decomposition, <laughs> meaning this is September, but one of the witnesses yesterday said that day it was 115 degrees, 115 degrees. It's, it's a wonder this man wasn't cooked. Um, in any case, so um, she talks about how he's discovered the police. They, um, they find on him, his phone, his wallet with money, his car keys, all of this is still on his person. Later on, they get a search warrant. They go in the house. Um, nothing's disturbed. No signs of forced entry. All the valuables are still there. The car is still present in the garage. So we know that robbery is not the motive here. So they also said that there was some damage to the bushes uh, in this, because it's a side yard next to the garage. And uh, there was some blood on the bushes and there was some blood on some outdoor decor. So nothing's disturbed in the house. So they go through his trash, uh, Jeff Gurman's trash, and they find a receipt in the trash that's uh, dated September 2nd at 9.03 a.m. from a restaurant called Roberto's Taco Shop. Now, I I'm curious, what are you getting at a taco shop at nine o'clock in the morning? Is there like a breakfast taco or maybe a breakfast burrito? I don't know. Anyway, he goes there, 9.03 a.m., makes a purchase, and they have surveillance footage of him at the shop. Then uh, I'm not going to show all the, the footage that was shown during the opening because it's considerable. I'll show it as it comes into evidence um, during my recaps. So, uh, so they're able to, this is like the last known sighting of him other than some surveillance footage that's picked up after the murder. So the, uh, the Baileys, the people that discovered, um, Mr. Garvin, they live on this little cul-de-sac and, uh, across the street from Mr. Garvin and, they were asked, do you have a ring camera? And, oh, yeah, we have a ring camera. So we're going to see the ring camera footage uh, there. And that shows the actual murder. Now, you can't really make out what's going on, but you can see that there's a struggle. You see this person walking into the side yard. Um, he's lying in wait. You know, a few minutes go by. You see German open the garage door, uh, walk over to those that bushy area, and he's ambushed. Then you wait a few minutes after the struggle kind of stops and you see this man walking away. So what they did was they found, they canvassed the neighborhood. We, we know that they always canvass for additional ring camera footage and they find it. And they find that this same person that was walking away on the Bailey's ring camera footage was, uh, a person that gets into a Yukon Denali. And later on, he takes that Yukon Denali and he actually parks, goes back to Jeff Garman's home, parks in front of the house, walks over to the side yard, almost like he's checking to make sure he's dead, um, gets back in his vehicle and leaves. So then the police start canvassing everywhere, trying to figure out where this vehicle came from, where it went. And they were able to put together like a pretty good synopsis. Um, the morning of the murder, that vehicle is seen canvassing the neighborhood, just kind of 
meandering around Jeff Garman's neighborhood. And afterwards, it's headed in a specific direction. And I'm going to tell you what direction that is soon. So we're going to hear from the um, medical examiner who will also tell us, uh, in addition to the type of injuries, the sharp force injuries, that he had foreign DNA under his fingernails, which we know four or five days later was identified to be Robert Tellis's DNA. So at this point, the police ask for information from the public. They do like a press conference. They show this surveillance footage of the vehicle, the person, you know, anybody with information. And they're getting tips. And one of the tips is about Robert Tellis because Jeff German had been writing articles about him. And as a result, well, we don't know if it was as a result, but end result is Robert Tellis was running for re-election of public minister. He loses the election and there's still additional articles being written, written about him. And there's some other stuff going on in the background. So if I didn't think there was motive before. I'm thinking there's motive now. Just, just wait, don't go anywhere. So, When they were showing the footage in the opening statements of this guy lying in wait in the bushes, they kept the courtroom camera kept panning over to Robert Tellis. And this man is the only man I've ever seen who has resting bitch face. <laughs> He's looking all concerned. Oh, hmm. You know, like, oh, this is horrible. Oh, I just can't watch. Um, but every time they pan to him, he's got like this mean look on his face. Like he's just angry. Like male resting bitch face. Yeah, I'm telling you. So they eventually discover that the defendant's wife drives a Yukon Denali. And earlier I said that they had canvassed the neighborhood for video surveillance footage and the video, the Yukon Denali after it leaves the neighborhood is heading towards the neighborhood of Robert Tellis. They, they do the opposite thing. Now they're canvassing Robert Tellis's neighborhood for video footage of when and who leave in this Yukon Denali that morning of the murder. And they see they have they have one particular picture. And uh, when it comes into evidence, I will show it to you where you can see the driver was wearing the, the exact same thing as the person that committed the murder. <laughs> so case closed. Can we move on? No, just wait. So <laughs> when they bring Robert in for questioning, they notice that he has a cut on his finger. He's it's covered with a bandage. They ask him to take the bandage off. And I don't remember what the explanation is for that, but when it comes into evidence, we will uh, talk about that. So they get a search warrant for Robert Tellis's home. Now they, after they bring him in for questioning, they release him. He goes back home. So under the couch, they find these shoes, these sneakers that match the sneakers worn by the murderer. One of the sneakers is cut in half, and then that half is cut into little pieces. I don't know what that's all about. Then in the garage, they find a gray bag matching exactly the bag that this person was carrying, the murderer. And then on the bottom of this tool shelf, they find a sprout grocery bag. And inside of it was the same straw hat, but it was all cut up. But you can see that it's the exact same style. It's got like the three holes and yeah, it's, yeah. And this was interesting during the opening statements. The prosecution didn't talk about how the police had gone back to make his arrest because they had identified his DNA under Jeff Gurman's fingernails and that he wouldn't come out of the house and that he had injured himself. All she said to the jury was uh, that afternoon after he was released after questioning, he attempted suicide and he's taken to the hospital. So what happened here? <laughs> what happened to, uh, yeah, I don't know. So then she talks about a series of communications between 
uh, Robert Tellis and Jeff Gurman regarding these articles that are being written. Then they search um, Robert Tellis's computer and they find a Google Earth picture taken of the front yard of Robert Tellis and that exact area where he was found. And this was looked up prior to the murder. So why in the world would that be on his computer? And um, Jeff German, coincidentally, had recently, just prior to the murder, recently filed with the Office of the Public Administrator a public records request for all the emails in the office, the inner office emails, the external emails. He wanted everything. So 15 hours before the murder, Robert Tellis is notified by the powers that be, I guess, that handle these records requests that they're going to try to honor this records request. What was in those emails? I don't know. So that was the prosecution's opening statement. Now, the defense, this was Robert Dreskovich, his attorney, his current attorney, not not bad on the eyes. He's got that kind of rough around the edge kind of look, but he's in a suit. You know, I like that look, the, the whole rough look in a suit. It just it just does something. Anyway, he talked. He says, "I'm going to tell you the story of Robert German." I'm thinking, oh boy. And he talks to the jury. He says, "Usually, when defense defense, you know, we, he's innocent until proven guilty. I don't have to say a thing to you, but I'm going to tell you his story." Okay. He's a family man. He's married. He's got three kids, and I felt guilty because I showed the picture of the kids in my video previewing this case. Well, they showed the video of the three kids or the pictures of the three kids. I'm like, oh, okay. It's out there now. Anyway, uh, they talked about how he went to UNLV law school. He was president of the Student Bar Association. He starts his own probate firm. And um, during that time, he was awarded the pro bono attorney of the year for 2016. And then he rubs, runs in 2019 for public office, public administrator. Now, what is a public administrator? I, I will tell you since if you don't care to watch that prior video, this is the office where if you die without a will or any heirs, your assets go to this office and they've got to figure out what to do with them liquidate them, you know, and, you know, try to find the heirs, try to find, you know, it's, it's interesting. And um, then he talks about some of the things that he accomplished while he was in the office of public administrator. So he made choosing a state, he made, <laughs> he made closing estates faster. He cut back on large amounts of tax funded overtime. So he said there was a particular employee, a veteran employee said that got $140,000 over a two year period, 2017, 2018, over and above the $150,000 he made in his salary for those same two years. Then after Robert German gets in there, the guy only makes 13500 in overtime. So what was going on in this office? He's there to clean house, apparently. So then we, then things get really confusing because apparently, I don't know how this attorney got it. I don't know how the jury sat through this because I had to listen to it at least three times to understand it. And you're probably not going to understand it after I explain it. But this is what Robert Tellis's defense is. Corruption. He was doing his own independent investigation of corruption in the public administrator's office. And he had put together this multi-page report and he takes it to the district attorney's office. Now, what this was about was that apparently, because some of the assets that are in this office are houses, lots of houses. And there was a company named Compass Realty that was, that it looked to him like 
they were being shown, this company was being shown favoritism. But what companies realty would do is they would hire what they call a, what did they call it? Straw buyer. And this straw buyer would get appraisals on the property that were way lower than what they should have been. And then make the purchase of the property and turn around and sell it for 40% above the price they paid for it. So this realty company was making millions. So he's trying to expose this corruption that's going on in the public administrator's office. He takes this report to the district attorney. The district attorney says, I want you to meet up with this criminal investigation uh, detective and his last name is Jappy. And so he, you know, there's some emails that go back and forth and they eventually they meet up. And this Jaffe is, says, you know, he's very interested. He reads the report. He's like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to conduct an investigation. So this is uh, in March of 2022. So April, May, June, July, like six months before the murder. So the straw buyer that they were looking at was a woman named Cynthia Sutherland. But at some point during this investigation by Officer Jaffe, um, he's approached by a lieutenant in this Las Vegas, uh, what do they call it? Metro Sheriff's Office, um, by the name of Kim McMahon. So Lieutenant McMahon approaches him. Uh, she has a side business. She's also a realtor. And she approaches him and she gives him information that causes him to do like a 180. And he starts looking at what the defense attorney is calling his client, the whistleblower. So now all the tables are turned. And this woman is saying that Robert Tellis is the one that was corrupt and was, was acting as a straw buyer. I don't know. That's what I gathered from it. So it wasn't this Southern lady. It was actually him, but the defense attorney pointed out why would Robert Tells draw attention to himself if he's the one that's corrupt by going to the district attorney and going to this detective. So now this detective is looking at him. Um, I just want to make sure I'm because this is very, very confusing. So at some point, this Jaffe, who's now looking at Robert Tellis, gets a... Um, an order to tap his phone, not tap his phone, but uh, does it tap his phone? Track his phone, track, track his phone. And also a warrant to conduct surveillance on him. And during the day of the commission of the murder, this was all in place. His phone was being tracked. His, um, and they had the ability to surveil him. During, interestingly enough, during the commission of the murder, there is no cell site data, location, location data. There's no location data. What happened to it? Um, but they know TELUS is at home. And then they say that there were 67 possible hits found through the DMV search for vehicles that were matched the description of the Yukon Denali. And he was the only one they focused on. They never followed up on any of the other vehicles. Then he points out, the defense attorney, that there was no blood found on Mr. Tellus. Now, they don't take him in down for questioning for five days, four or five days after the murder. But when they found the shoes and the hat and the bag, there's no blood on any of this. But at the crime scene, there was blood in the bushes and there was blood on the outdoor decor. How did no blood get on these other items? Um, 
He mentioned this defense attorney. Now this is really reaching that the hat and the shoes were cut up because it's easier to plant evidence in smaller pieces. Okay. So now, and this is the only time that that word was used plant evidence. Um, I don't know if he wasn't supposed to say it, but it's out there. They're now the jury's thinking, Oh, was he set up? So then the defense attorney talked about a witness that came forward with a, uh, with a statement and gave a statement that the killer wearing the same articles of clothing was spotted a few days before the murder in a park and he was acting strangely. Um, that was never followed up on. And the cell site data location shows that Robert was not anywhere near that park that day. Also, there was no blood found in the vehicle. Then uh, you on the day of the that they take him into custody after he attempted suicide, um, Chappie is there. He actually rides in the ambulance with Robert Tellis to the hospital. And then during Robert Tellis's police interview, Chaffee walks in the room to ask about a case totally unrelated to what they were working on. So what is this Chaffee guy up to? Then uh, the defense wraps it up by saying, you know, losing your job is not a motive for murder and killing a journalist doesn't kill the story because he was actually working on a story at the time and someone, another reporter picked up the story and published it. So in any case, um, I do want to make a comment. If you want to watch this trial, this is, the camera work is really, really well done. Um, they've got the witness in one box, in another box, they've got, I don't know, <laughs> there's another box. And then the, there's a third box for whatever's on the monitor, pictures, video, whatever. I think it's really, really well done. So I, I do want to talk about the first couple of witnesses as Couple, first couple of witnesses, and that is the Baileys, Holly and her husband, Roe, R-O-W, Roe Bailey. Uh, they, Like I said, they've lived on this little cul-de-sac for 27 years across the street from Jeff Gurman. And Jeff Gurman's lived there for 26 years. And they knew that Jeff Gurman would never leave his garage door open. And um, Holly said that day she was very, very busy, but she was just coming and going, leaving the house, coming back. And when she left the house around noon, she saw that his garage door was open. So she texts or emails him and she does not get a response. So she comes back home. She tells her um, husband and he says, well, we'll just hold on because the car's in the garage. So, and they're thinking, well, maybe he you know, is expecting someone or, you know, so about three, three 30, she texts him again and she does not get a response. So the husband said, if we don't hear anything by tonight, um, then I'm going to go over there and just close the garage door. We'll go over there and check. So that evening they still haven't heard anything. They go over, they check, uh, they don't see anything. It must've been dark because I don't know how you missed that horrendous scene in the side yard, but in any case, they, they closed the garage door. And then she sends him an email, uh, sends Jeff an email saying, you know, I hope it was okay. We closed your garage door. You know, we haven't heard from you. They're thinking he's out of town. So she gets woken up early the next morning by her husband. And he's like, the garage door's still open. Um, call 311 and uh, ask for a wellness check. So she says, uh, okay, let me get my coffee first. No, I'm just at that. <laughs> anyway, so she says, no, let me, let me email him one more time. So she emails him, no response. Then she, uh, she says, you know, why don't you go check the backyard? And he's like, oh, great idea. Let me go check the backyard. And this is, uh, she points out that it was 150 degrees that day. So she said, next thing she knows, her husband's come running back in the house, screaming and yelling that he's found a body and he's all upset because she said when he gets nervous and anxious, he's, he's, he has an accent that kicks in and the 911 operator couldn't understand him. So then we hear from Roe. 
where'd my notes go? So then we hear from Ro and he, both of these people were very, very emotional. Even he, he started crying at one point, but he talks about how he went over there that morning and he goes into the backyard and to get to the backyard, you have to go to the left of the garage. Um, the little side yard where his body was, it was to the right of the garage. So he goes to the left of the garage, goes in the backyard, doesn't see anything, comes back out and he looks he figures, well, let me just go check over here. So he starts to cross in front of the garage and he sees the body and um, he realizes that, you know, he's, this was not a natural death and that he is dead. So those are the first two witnesses. There was no cross uh, examination of these two witnesses and uh, that is where I will pick up my recap in the next video. So I'll do the rest of day one and uh, start day two for you in the next video. Have a great day. I'm also going to do a recap today in the day two of the Susan Lorenz trial. So look for that video. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.